Congress wanted us to come and come underneath and support and encourage the African leadership there. So it's been a different role for us, but it's good learning humility and how to submit um, to the, the leadership staff there. So it's been a good time. Um, God has put on our heart, mainly um, for the kids there. We have 130 orphans that are there. Um, we, let's see, and about half are um, youth, uh, teenagers. So pray for us for grace and patience um, as we work with them. So God has put on our heart a big thing of the discipleship and working with um, these kids. And I think of Pastor Steve's, I think it was sermon last week, how Jesus in working, discipling the disciples, that it's not just a class, it's not just a one-time class once a week, but it's a life that he lived with them and working with them and that's what I feel with our life is in South Sudan, is working with these kids and we help lead chores, we help do discipleship classes. And so in these times when they make mistakes, it's working through them, uh, parenting as everybody knows, but just being willing and having a willing heart to serve. Um, and so pray with us that as we go and join the leadership staff there, that we'll all have the same vision unified in Christ in um, sharing with these kids and raising them up to be godly leaders of South Sudan. And so Kim is going to share a bit about the tr atrocity, not atrocities, but the insecurity that's going on in South Sudan. Um, it's been fairly safe, uh, so we thank God for his protection and peace over our compound, and Ye, and Ye has been protected um, from everything that's going on. And it's a miracle in, in itself that the protect, his protection over us, and there's been lots of other stuff going on, but Harvesters like lives in this little bubble and it's just been amazing Amen. they say the people in the town of Ye say that we're on the front lines you live there you live there that's what they always say to us we're like come visit it's fine um so south sudan is where we serve we're going to just go through a few slides but this is east africa south sudan and uganda so right now south sudan is in a state of civil war it became its own nation in 2000 11 and in 2013 civil war started and so over 2 million people are displaced in South Sudan over one-third of the population of the nation of South Sudan is displaced and many of them are refugees that live in Uganda so harvesters has three campuses Terakeka that's where we were for many years yay that's where we are now and um, we started a primary school in the refugee camp in Uganda. So we're just trying to continue working with the South Sudanese as a ministry. Um, yeah, so this is just about the refugee crisis. Um, tens of thousands have been killed, and Lance didn't want to say atrocities, but we have to be careful what we say, but some people are doing some terrible things, and that's just the reality that these people live. I'm so thankful because the Bible tells us that God is near to the brokenhearted, right? And so the people of South Sudan are brokenhearted. They've been, lots of bad things have happened, but um, God wants to be near to them, even as they've had to leave everything behind again and run to a place of refuge in another country. This is our home. We just want to show people that we live in a great home. God has provided. We live on the compound with the kids, but we have our own house. It has running water and a toilet and a refrigerator, and so we're super thankful because although we're living in a very remote place, God gave us a safe little home to live in. That was Thanksgiving dinner at our house. Lance does maintenance on the compound and Gideon gets to work with him sometimes. Um, this was plowing the fields. We're trying to grow as much food as we can to feed the kids and um, we have a gardener with us there. Lance and the young men. So um, that's one of our biggest ministries is to the teenagers. Like you said, there's about 70 teenagers and they are orphans. They haven't been parented and you those of you who have teenagers realize they need a lot of, they just need a lot. And so um, <laughs> we, are, we are trying to be that for them and help train the staff to be involved in their lives. So Lance works with these guys on a regular basis. And these are my girls and my ladies. I get to minister to the house mothers 
who are widows that have nothing left. Their homes are gone and they live with us and the girls. I get to mostly work with the preteen girls um, and help them figure out who they are. That's my <laughs> heart's desire. <clears throat> There's a couple of the girls, beautiful faces. And we did have a missionary come and spend six months with us last year. So that was a huge blessing. We pray that God sends more people um, to us. There's Gideon and his buddies. We have a six-year-old Gideon. He just finished kindergarten. He's going into first grade. And um, those are his little buddies that he plays with a lot of the time. So um, we're thankful that he has friends. Um, it's, we're the only missionaries there. So that's interesting for us. Um, but it works out, okay? <laughs> There's some more kids and faces, smiles, lots of smiles. Um, just the projection for South Sudan is not good. The economy is crashing. The inflation rate is huge. Uh, the government officials don't get paid. The police don't get paid. So when your country is falling apart around you and you're losing what you have and you don't get paid anything and prices are going up, that can lead to a pretty unstable environment where people rob and steal. And so that's probably our biggest concern is protection from that kind of stuff. But the people feel hopeless. Everyone was filled with hope when they had a new nation and now they're like, what's happening? We're losing everything again. So um, this is one of our guards. He left Sudan. He was kicked out because he's South Sudanese. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and he lives with us or near us and he's a guard for us and he trusts God for his protection. I can tell you his story, personal story later if you have a minute um, of how God has protected him in the middle of a war. Um, healthcare, Harvesters has a hospital but it's closed because of the war. We're praying that it can open again this year. The death rate is really high so you can pray with us about that. That's one of our friends, another great story to tell, um, just how God blessed me. I'm going to tell it really quick. He was our um, administrator in Terakeka. We worked with him, and I was kind of his boss, and uh, I was stressed out a lot, and I didn't always treat him with respect. Believe it or not, and some of you know my dad, but um, can be loud and obnoxious sometimes, and, <laughs> you know, and South Sudanese are more quiet, and and this guy worked so hard for us and he and I would have conflict. Anyway, he ended up going to another job and we ended up leaving and God convicted me about the way my relationship with him. So I asked the Lord forgiveness, I repented. And God, of course, forgives us, thank you, Lord. But I started praying, God, will you give me a chance to see this guy again? Well, the war broke out and he had to run and flee. He became a refugee in Uganda and I never thought I'd see him again. And then we were in Uganda getting ready. We were on break or something. We're walking down the street and I hear a voice. And I'm like, I know that voice. And I turn and it's him. And I said, Lucky. And he said, Kim. And we hugged. And then I sat down and I said, before we even talk about how you are, I need to ask your forgiveness. And I just felt, and he said, of course, I forgive you. Will you forgive me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just felt like it was a gift from the Lord to me personally, you know, God forgave me, but I just asked, God, will you please give me a chance to see him again? And I didn't know if he was alive or dead or what happened. And his story is also an amazing story I can tell of God, how God protected him. Um, he had to run for his life out of the war, and, uh, but he's doing good, and we were so happy to see him. So, Gideon and his buddy, Loki, is one of our staff. <clears throat> There's the traditional... Uh, Mundari girls of South Sudan. Some of our girls posing. And uh, so that's our prayer, that we could bring hope to a hopeless place. And I just wanted to share, you know, Jesus is the hope of the nations. He's the hope of every situation, even when it seems like we can't see how that works out. <clears throat> And so for us, we've had this year of wanting to be the light in the darkness, wanting to share Jesus' love. But there's so much hopelessness and fear around us, and we found ourselves falling into that. And even though we believe what the Bible says, that Jesus is the hope, 
sometimes you just can't see in the situation where the hope is, you know? And so we'd find ourselves coming in the house and saying things like, oh, what's the point? It'll never change. How, what are we even doing, you know? And the Lord revealed to us that that's us be, coming under that hopelessness. But the truth is we don't always know how to walk in hope when it looks pretty hopeless, you know? And so that's been our biggest prayer, that God would teach us how we can bring hope and light and joy in a place where there's hopelessness, darkness, and sorrow, you know? And um, we want to ask you to pray with us. We love that this church prays for us and believes in what God is doing in South Sudan. We feel privileged that we get to be there with these people and walk through it. We believe that these kids that we're with are the hope for the nation of South Sudan. If we can raise them up in the word of God, they're going to be the ones who change the government, who change the way things are done. So pray with us that we would parent these children well, that we would raise up a team of parents for the kids. Pray for freedom from fear and hopelessness. Pray for us as a family with Gideon for clear direction that we would know where to walk, where to speak, where to be involved. And you can pray for Gideon um, just as we're homeschooling him and he is um, kind of alone as the only Western child there that God will just continue to surround him and protect him. There's been a few times where it's been a little scary at night and he just slept through the whole thing. And I just feel like that's God's hand, you know, protecting him. He wakes up in the morning like, what's going on? We're like, hey, God's got you. So we're so thankful for the prayers they've been working. God has been faithful to protect us. And uh, we'd love to share more with you. We have a table in the back. We'll be there after the service and um, would love to... Share more if you want to sign up for our newsletter or sponsor a child. We'd love to talk to you about that. So thank you very much. Thank you. How many of you all feel called to South Sudan? <laughs> we got some hands up. Hallelujah. Again, there's many ways. We're all called to South Sudan because we're in South Sudan through Lance and Kim. Amen. And as we pray and lift them up, we're impacting that nation. And so that's a blessing. So that's the blessing of being part of this church. You know, we are all over the world in many different nations, touching many different lives. So we thank, be thankful for that. Because, you know, some people have this nationalist view. Well, in the world, you can, you, you know, that's, that's normal. But as kingdom people, our view should be worldwide. As kingdom people, our views should be worldwide. We care about the United States of America, but we're not even from here. Hello? We're foreigners here. We're aliens. We've been brought here from heaven. We're all sent. We're all missionaries. We all have a mission field. And it's here, this nation, if you're, if you're living here, if you've been sent here, we've all been sent here, or you've been sent to another country, but we're all sent ones. We're all, and so that's what I'm hoping through this whole series every fifth Sunday in Great Commission, that we will really get that, that we are all on a mission. Every day you awake, God has plans for you. He didn't just save us and give us that ticket to heaven, and we just wait till that day, can't wait till we get to the better, the, the by and by, no, he saved you to use you. No matter how bad your life is, was, God wants to clean you up, change your life around, and now begin to use you as a change agent. Well, you might say, well, I'm not even near there yet. I, my life is still messed up. Your life is better than it used to be, isn't it? Hello? I was sharing, we were having a training for our um, YWAM team. I mean, not our YWAM team, our team that's going to, we don't have a YWAM team. Going to St. Croix, staying at the YWAM base in St. Croix, training them on how to share their testimony. And that's a big part. Some might think, well, I don't have much of a testimony. Did he get saved? That's a big part of going on a mission trip. You better have gotten saved. And if you got saved, are you a little bit better off than you used to be? And if you are, then you got something to talk about. You got something to share. Because there's a lot of people stuck 
And if you're not stuck anymore, you've moved on. You're still moving towards something greater, but you've moved on from where you, you, where you used to be. You have something to offer. And so we are all called. And where we're called, again, you, are, you're, you didn't come to church this morning. I really want to get this in our heads because I'm, I'm actually getting sick of hearing I'm going to church. You're not going to church. Hello. You're not going to church. This is not church. Huh? I know we've been taught that all our life, but it's not church. It's not biblical. We are the church. Hello? We are the church. We're called to assemble ourselves together to be equipped and encouraged to do what? To go out and serve. Our mission field is our home. It's our neighborhood. It's our job and wherever we put our feet to go. That is our mission field. And so we need to be equipped. So let's go over the Great Commission. Oh, I forgot my scriptures on my iPad. That's almost dead because of my son. <laughs> I told him last night, do not keep that plugged in. And he did not. So if I lose power, I still got God's power. Amen? So no worry on my end. But... It's good to have the scripture right here before me. Okay. Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, or 19 through 20. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore now, when he says that, understand, if you're in Christ, that means all authority in heaven and earth has been given to you. Because this is Christ speaking. So all those that are now in Christ, all authority... Have you ever gone to some place and wish you had authority? Hello, you go into uh, uh, you go to buy something in a store and they just don't treat you right, and you wish you had the authority to fire them. <laughs> we have authority given by God, delegated authority. You have the authority over the enemy. When you see the enemy arise, when you see things you don't like, you have authority over that what you see. We have authority that says whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. God has given us the keys to the kingdom. We have authority. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go. Now, what to do with that authority? What are we to do with that authority? It's one thing to have authority. It's another thing. Some people have been given authority, but they don't do what's right with that authority that's been given them. And then that authority is taken away. So when you have a job and, it's, and you've given authority and you don't do what... The person who gave you authority told you to do, they may take that authority away from you. But God gave us authority. And now he said what we're to do with it. Go therefore and do what? Make disciples of nations. Now we understand about the importance of making disciples of people, right? And we're called to reach people, but we're also called to reach all that is within a nation. That God said that he is seated in heaven until what? The restoration of what? All things. Don't just said people. All things. Restore means what? Bring back to the way it was. Now, I, I love the slogan, Pastor Roger, make America great again. But what I desire more than anything, because when I look back at America's past, there were some years that maybe was good and all that, but there's a lot of darkness as well. But what I'm looking for, returning back to, is the way it was in the garden. That's where I want to go back to. The way it was in the beginning. Restoration of all things is restoring the earth to the way God intended it to be. And this is our work, and that's why he saved us. There is work to be done. So the enemy's job is to get us so caught up in our own personal problems, hello, that we don't even have much of a thought about South Sudan or anywhere else in the world. We're just thinking about ourselves. And church is just a help me club. A bless me club is where I get help and my blessing rather than getting equipped to go out and serve. We're called to serve. And you know what? When we step out and start serving others and start doing... God's will, God starts taking care of our problems. Hello? You want to get free of some problems? Start helping other people and their problems. Now, don't help everybody's problem, but help that which God leads you to. Ask God, what has he called you to? Amen? 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, this is a big part of discipleship, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So as we learn the word, we're called to apply the word. And apply the word means apply the word to everything. Every aspect of life is in the word of God. Every part of society, there's, there, there is God's wisdom for that area in the word of God. So we're talking about discipling nations. And nations are made up of many different aspects. One of those aspects, which we're going to talk to, about today, is government. Okay, we're going to talk about government. And then weeks coming, we're going to talk about education, economy. We're going to talk about... Um, Business, we're going to talk about media and the arts, we're going to talk about family, religion. These are all the different aspects that create culture, create nation, and create what we're about in living. You know, what do we do with our day every day? It's all these areas, and God wants to disciple those areas. He wants to bring the Word of God into those areas. I forgot, I have another mic I can use. You have that up? I'm going to switch mics so I can use both hands. All right, switching mics. Three, two, one. I forgot to do that first service, too. Testing one, two. Mic check. Think I'm on? Hallelujah. So bottom line is, we got to understand what our part is. Do your part to reach the world. Each of you have a part. God wants to fill the entire earth with his glory. Every little bit of it, every area of it, that means everything. Everything means everything. I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Sometimes I hear Christians are too scared to go to places like Atlantic City. God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I was reading about an individual that he believes the Lord told them to um, go to a club each night. He's making disciples in a nightclub. For whatever reason, people just come to him and are drawn to him and start telling them, him his, their problems. Now he started a Bible study with these same people that he, dis, that he reached in a nightclub. Are everyone called to do that? No. But some of you might be. We don't have to fear darkness. Darkness fears the light. We are the salt of the world, the light of the world, the salt of the earth. So we're called to go out into it and not be afraid of it because the same God that saves us is the same God that keeps us. He is able to protect us. All we got to do is acknowledge him. I, for one, I'm not, I would not desire to go to South Sudan, but I trust if that was God's will... I'm in the safest place I can be. As long as I'm walking with God. See, walking with God is not just coming here. Walking to God is all about obedience. And that's a daily practice to always obey. So long as I'm in obedience, I'm in the safest place I can be, no matter where I'm at. If I am sent to North Korea right now, I'm in the safest place I can be. Walk with the Lord. It's the best thing we can do. Amen? So we're learning to become missional. Being missional isn't just for a designated few that are called to be missionaries with some organization. Being missional means actually doing mission right where you are. We are a missional people, a missional assembly. Missional means you adopt the posture of a missionary, learning and adapting to whatever culture you're part of. And learning how to reach the people that God has placed around you. We are called, as this says, says, people restored and what? Inspired. Then what? Serving everywhere. Our emphasis that I believe that God has laid on my heart over the next 40 years. Now we're in ministry. We're celebrating our 40th year anniversary. And God's done a lot of restoring and inspiring. And we have some people serving but God is calling us all to raise the standard to all of us to be servants. For all of us to be serving everywhere. 
not just in this building, but everywhere. Yeah, we all have jobs, but do you understand that you're a servant of the Lord on your job? That you've carried the presence of God with you. That you're there to impact the people. You change the atmosphere wherever you go. Darkness leaves and light comes in. People's hearts who have wanted nothing to do with God all of a sudden are open to God because you're there. Having this understanding. So with that, let's get into government. Because some of us here are called to government. One thing we're going to realize is that we're all part of a government. We're all in a government, but we're all actually working for the government. Did you know that? It brings a lot of benefits, doesn't it? Working for the government. But we work for, for the government of God. We work for the government of God. And what is our role as God's ambassadors in this nation, part of the government of God? It is what? Isaiah 9-7. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord of hosts, the spirit of the living God is inside you. And he is increasing his government on earth through you. How does he do that? Again, going back, all we got to do, our role, is to know the word. When we know his word, we know his will. As we apply his word, we establish his will in our area of life. We increase his government. He governs. He wants to govern the world. But the only way he can do that is by our free will choice to let him govern our lives. God doesn't overthrow governments or doesn't do like the old, like the um, crusaders. That's not our way. We're not here to take over yet. Jesus is going to do that. He's going to return and do that. But in this time, we're to infiltrate. We're to penetrate. We're to, we're to have influence wherever we are, to begin to change. God does not want to see this world miserable, and he does not like to see suffering. We want to make a difference in the world, but for quite a long time, the church has played patty cake in the building, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for Jesus to return, and Jesus said, I can't return until you get to work. I want everyone out in the world to know me. But some people are so lost in darkness because of corruption of government that they can't even know the Lord. People can't even go to some countries in this world. God wants us to change the government. He wants to influence governments. Look what's happened already in North Korea. Change is beginning to happen. South Sudan, change began to happen a country that was all Muslim, basically ruled, became South Sudan, but now it's dealing with more problems. But how do we bring change? We, God's people, are the, pro uh, the, the answers to the world's problems. We're not to ignore them and just say, you know what? Hey, it's just a sign of the times. Jesus is coming back. What if you were, uh, somebody beat you down, took all you had, left you on the side, a Christian walks by you and says, oh, it's just a sign of the times, kept on walking. We are not to ignore the problems of the world. We're supposed to be the answer to the problems of the world. We're supposed to be in the place that God put us. It's not just a job to get a paycheck. It is our opportunity to see the advancement of God's kingdom in every area of life. Amen? So regarding government, number one, what does the Bible say is our call regarding government? Number one, to respect and honor government leaders. Romans 13, 7. Well, I can't stand that Donald Trump. Number one, as a believer, as a citizen of the kingdom of God, our number one position as a Christian regarding government is to respect and honor government leaders. Pray for them. Let God 
take care of them. Nobody is perfect. Everybody has flaws. But the best thing to do is pray. Seek God. Sometimes people who get in power are the, because God gives us what we, we deserve sometimes. God gave the children of Israel Saul. That's not who he wanted for them, but that's what the people wanted. They said, okay, have them. Whatever we're to do, we're to pray and seek God and trust him. And David, who ended up being God's, who had God's heart, he didn't get into power right away. He had to wait till God removed Saul. There's a waiting. There's a time. There's something that we got to learn. Sometimes God puts people in position just so that we can learn a lesson. So we can learn how much we need God. Hello? Number two, be subject to government and obey its laws. Number three, pray for civil leaders. And number four, which some of us don't like, is pay our taxes. I'm glad that we live in a nation, I've been to nations where they don't take care of the roads. They don't have no military presence, no protection, no security, no anything. Our taxes pay for those things. Do they spend our money not always wisely? Yeah, nobody's perfect. No nation's perfect unless everyone's walking with God and no nation has that yet. So therefore we can expect not everything to be perfect, but we're to honor the word of God, amen? As 1 Timothy 2 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for who? All people. So if you're a Democrat, you pray for Republicans. Republican, you pray for Democrats. We pray for everyone, no matter what their back party is. We pray for them because we want what's best for this nation. Amen? So let us not be like the world, talking like the world. We can expect the world to be the world. The world is all divisive, always one against the other. We're not to be that way. We're trying to unite the world, bring, us to, bring it together. And it says here, when we, when we pray, this is the result, peace and quiet lives and all godliness and holiness. If we want a peaceful nation, the key, we have a big role. Yeah, the, the, the military did their part, Police do their part. Government does their part. But as, gover as the government of God, our words mean a lot. Our prayers affect everything. So don't, you know, the best thing you can do is, instead of complain is pray. Amen? And declare things like Psalm 72, 11 says, Yes, all kings shall fall, fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. So you can take that scripture, it's a, it's, a, it's a prophecy, and begin to release that. I declare in Jesus' name that Kim Jong-un will bow down before the Lord and serve him with all of his heart. <laughs> Dave Stabler and his family just asked me to pray because they left to Cuba today. We declare that the president of Cuba will fall down on his knees and make Jesus Christ his Lord in Jesus' name. With all the corruption in Venezuela, we declare that the president of Venezuela will get down on his knees and make Jesus his Lord. Amen? Our prayers matter. There is work to be done. There's prayers to be released and work to be done. So what are we doing each day? Are we wasting our life away? Are we caught up in our own concerns and our own problems? Are we just caught up in, in church life and church world and, and all that when there is so much going on in the world that God wants to do something about, but his people are idle, so acting like civilians when they're called to be part of his army, soldiers? We need to be about it, Amen. We need to get up and be about it. When we get about God's will, he gets about our lives. He begins to take care of us, amen? Romans 13, one through three says, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority, anti-government groups, often I found that most of the anti-government groups do it in the name of God. They actually use the name of God, a lot of these groups. 
Look at the history of this nation. Look at the David Koresh group and some of these crazy groups that did things in the name of God that were anti-government. The word of God says what it says. And we need to follow it. Bottom line. No matter how we feel, no matter what we think of our government, we need to follow the word of God. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. This is what it says. This is our responsibility as citizens of the kingdom within the government that he's placed us. So how should we respond if our Christian liberty there was taken from us? And in some aspects in our nation, that's been attacked. Some of our Christian rights, our Christian liberty has been, it's been attacked. What do we should do? Should we just obey? We just talked about obedience to the, the laws, but are there exceptions to the rule? Well, Acts 5, what does the word say? Always go back to what does the word say? Acts 5, 29, and, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Hello? So when it comes to somebody taking our purpose in this life is to preach the gospel in every nation, any nation that does not allow the preaching of the gospel, we are to disobey that law and obey the law of God. Amen. Now, there is understanding, let's say, on your job, you're not supposed to preach. Okay, there's a time to just do your work and to do it honorably. But then there's a time that people open up and you need to minister God's word. And God will lead you to do that. It doesn't have to be out in the open loud, but it might be at times as well. We got to follow God and follow his leading. He is king over all. So though we are to honor and respect the laws of our land and the governing officials, but God's law supersedes it all. God supersedes it all. Amen? What is the biblical way to govern? We live next to Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania in its history is one of the most amazing states. It's the only state that the founder of that state, William Penn, Actually, was, he felt his calling was to establish a territory under the principles of the Word of God in every way. He's one of the only individuals that actually did not come and just kill off all the First Nation people. He befriended them and became friends with them. They even made him a chief. An honorable man. I'm actually going to a William Penn dinner in um, Pennsylvania. And it was actually prophesied over me that I have a, a calling similar to a William Penn. And it says here, William Penn, if thou wouldst rule well, thou must rule for God. And to do that, thou must be ruled by him. It's not about just being rule, ruling for God. That don't work. You've got to rule, be ruled by him. See, we don't have authority unless God is given it to us. But we only have it as we walk with him. He gives us the authority. Those who will not be governed by God will be ruled by tyrants. If we choose as a majority in this nation to not be ruled by God, God will give over this nation to tyrants. The nations of this world that have tyrants ruling them, it's because the majority of the people don't allow God to rule their lives. If we want godly people in leadership, we must be, as a majority of people in this nation, have a desire to be ruled by God. And so far, we have about 70% that say they do so. So we're in a good place, but it's constantly decreasing. So there may be a time in some of our lifetimes that we have tyrants ruling this nation. But so help me God that I will not allow that to happen with all measure of authority that God has given me, that I will exercise that authority, affect the lives of those around me, and assure that this nation remains a godly nation. Amen? A God-fearing nation. Its history is not always God-fearing. There's been a lot of wrong in this nation. But overall, this has been one of the leading mission-sending nations it's one of the better governments of this entire world. It's one of the places where you get the more freedom than most other places. So though it has its flaws and though it hasn't been perfect and it has all kinds of darkness, 
I wouldn't, be in a, I wouldn't want to be in any other place. Hello? Amen. Amen? So let us continue to pray for this nation. If you are in government in any way, as we are, of course, in the kingdom of God, but if you're serving in any kind of American government position, this is the heart, Psalm 89, 14, of how you should serve. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. So in every area of government, we want to see God's righteousness, justice, mercy, and truth. Amen? And like Dr. Martin Luther King, who in this nation saw injustice, saw our nation not following its, its, its constitution that said all people are to be treated equally. And he stood against our nation because it was doing wrong, and he did a peaceful, in a peaceful manner, and it made a difference. We ourselves have to be willing to stand against whatever is wrong. We, if it's abortion, it's wrong. Christians today still protest against abortion. We should protest against whatever we see is wrong for the moral change of this nation. Martin Luther King said, we will not be satisfied. So if you're in government, you should not be satisfied. And we as God's people should not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream for all people. Hello? For all people. For everyone should receive justice and righteousness. And some of us really honor our president now and really like some of the things he's doing. But we've got to not be satisfied until justice and righteousness in every area of society. Amen? For blacks, whites, Hispanics, poor, middle class, wealthy, everyone should have equal opportunity and equal rights and be treated fairly. Amen? And in closing, the one thing we know, though, in this age, it will never be perfect. But we should shoot for perfection. But we know the perfect one is returning. And he'll continue, and he'll finish the work that we've been doing. He will completely establish his throne on earth in person. We're doing that spiritually. But he will actually come back in person. It says in Revelation 21, this is our hope. That no matter our efforts, sometimes, like Lance and Kim, it can be hopeless. Even with all the efforts, society can, it, things can just be so bad. Rape, murder, killing, just the worst of things. But Revelation 21 is our hope. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And God himself will be with them. And be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Amen. Who's looking forward to that day? Hallelujah. But you know what? Even though we're not yet there, what are we to do? We are to pray and we're to Go about God's business to occupy until he comes, to get to work, to prepare the way, to begin this work, to continue the work that he began to bring restoration throughout the earth. So my charge, God's charge for us today, number one, stop complaining and start praying for those in higher power. Number two, submit to those in authority over your life, no matter their imperfections. Yep, it can be also, we submit to each other, husband and wife. Everyone would submit to each other as unto the Lord. Third, let God govern your life so you can be part of the prophetic fulfillment of increasing his government on the earth. When you allow God to govern your life, God's government is established wherever you are. Number four, seek God how you can get more involved in establishing his justice and righteousness. Some things right now, actually this is the time if you want to be on school boards, go out and be on a school board. Often we have a very few people on school boards and they're doing all kinds of crazy things because there's nobody to counter it. 
That's one way that we all can serve in our government, on the school boards. Many other ways. Get involved. I am part of a group called Hamilton Together in the area that I live, and we're dealing with injustices. We're finding issues that are wrong, and we're seeing how we can support. I met with even the superintendent of Oakcrest to see how we as a church people can get alongside and help them. They actually have an issue with African-American female girls who are causing all kinds of, you know, they're fighting a lot and they have no solution. They don't have counseling or anything going on. I said, well, we can extend our hand and help that. How can we get involved in our community? Ask God. I guarantee you there's work to be done. Amen? Stop trying to get up here. Get out there. Amen? We, we only need a few people up here. But we need everyone out there. So let's close in prayer. Father, we just thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let's just, if you can, stand to your feet. We're all called to be part of the government of God. And we need his anointing. We need to walk in supernatural power. So Father, we thank you, Lord, as your ambassadors to this world, to this earth, we ask you day, today, oh God, for greater grace over our lives. We commit our lives to you to serve you and to serve this nation, to serve the nations of this world wherever you call us. God, we ask that you would open our hearts and reveal to us that area of service. Even, Lord, how we can make a greater influence on our jobs, in our homes, in our neighborhoods. So, Lord, we just ask you, God, to pour out your spirit fresh and new over our lives. Lord, as we leave this place, we go out as your servants. Use us, O oh God. Let us remove darkness, destroy the works of the enemy, and bring forth your light and expand your kingdom, increasing your government here on earth in the environment, in the territory that you've placed us. And we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 And I specifically want to pray for those who are in government, like work with the American government. If you work for the American government in any capacity, come forward for prayer. I'm going to just lay hands on you and just believe God for an increase of his anointing on your lives. God bless you. Feel free to come forward for prayer right now.